This video is about African prehistory. I would normally not make a video about this topic, but not long ago I received as a gift some books about the Spanish Sahara in a collection of stone artifacts that are thousands of years old. The collection consists of 25 stone projectile points, some of which are broken, and a hand tool that can be used as a scraper or a hand axe. My friend Kurt Rottweiler, who is a geologist, collected these items in the vicinity of Tinduf in the Western Sahara during 1962 and 1963 when he was working there. Tinduf is a city in Western Algeria with a population of about 60,000 native Algerians and more than 100,000 Sahrawis. The area in red was part of the Spanish Sahara from 1884 to 1958, which was ruled by Spain. It is now called Western Sahara. The Sahrawi culture is a mix of Berber, Black African and Arab traditions. A Sahrawi organization has been fighting for an independent Western Sahara for many years. The free zone of Western Sahara remains inaccessible behind the border barrier and large minefields that separate it from the Moroccan-occupied parts of the territory. My friend Kurt was employed by an American oil company and the petroleum exploration group with which he worked was based in Las Palmas in the Canary Islands. His schedule consisted of two weeks on the job and one week off. When he was on the job, he had 12-hour shifts and examined the material that was being brought up by the drills. A patrol of the Spanish Foreign Legion provided security for the workers and geologists. During his time off, Kurt found a place where flint tools were once snapped by Stone Age inhabitants. He gave some of the points to the Spanish captain in charge of the security detail, and the captain later organized a patrol to look for arrowheads in the area. Most of the stone projectile points were found on the surface. Some of them are smooth because they were polished by wind-blown sand for thousands of years. The Tinduf Basin province of North Africa, where Kurt worked, has been estimated to contain 2.6 billion barrels of oil and 123.9 trillion cubic feet of gas. I asked Kurt if there had ever been any incidents regarding the security of the camp, and he said no. But once they saw a group of armed men coming toward the camp and there were French soldiers from Algeria claiming to be lost. It turned out that they wanted to trade some Algerian wine for whiskey that the Americans had. The French soldiers set up camp nearby and socialized with the workers for a couple of days and then they went back to Algeria. In addition to the stone artifacts, Kurt gave me three books about the Spanish Sahara and African prehistory written in Spanish. A big leather-bound book has the title the Spanish Sahara, a Geological, Geographic and Botanical Study. The book has five authors and was published in Madrid in 1949. This book has maps of the geological structures in the region and pictures showing some of the characteristics of the terrain and its vegetation. Another book is entitled Prehistory of North Africa and of the Spanish Sahara by Martin Almagro Bash. This book was published in Barcelona in 1946. This book covers many aspects of African prehistory with emphasis on the Spanish Sahara region. This image shows some Neolithic arrowheads. The Neolithic period is the later part of the Stone Age, when ground or polished stone weapons and implements prevailed. This is an illustration of scrapers and various stone tools with sharp edges. The book illustrates some projectile points from Cape Juby. The page on the right has some points that are similar to the ones that Kurt collected in that region. The points in the middle row have the general characteristics described in the book for the Cape Juby area. The page on the left shows fragments of decorated ostrich eggs and the page on the right has some examples of ceramic pot fragments. This book also has examples of petroglyphs found in the region. The images carved on the rocks by prehistoric humans illustrate some of the animals that inhabited the region before the Sahara became a desert. The third book is entitled Manual of African Prehistory by two authors. It was published in Madrid in 1962. These three books were sponsored by the Institute of African Studies and the Superior Council of Scientific Investigations of Spain. This book illustrates the types of stone implements found in various regions of Africa. The book discusses the stone crafts practiced in various parts of Africa and it identifies the cultures that inhabited each region. Crafting stone arrowheads requires understanding the properties of stones and how they react to impacts and pressure. Making arrowheads requires selecting stones that will break with sharp edges. Large flakes are obtained by hitting a flint core with a hammer stone. The large flakes are formed into arrowheads by applying pressure to the edges with the tip of an antler or bone to remove small flakes along the edge. 
This image highlights two of the flakes removed by pressing the flint edge from the opposite side. Flaking the edge creates a serrated edge that works like a steak knife. A projectile that has been trimmed on both sides is called a bifacial artifact. If it is trimmed on only one side, it is called a unifacial artifact. The manufacture of this particular small bifacial point required pressure flaking the edge with a bone or antler that had a sharp tip of about 1 mm in diameter in order to remove the small flakes along the edge. This collection of Paleolithic and Mesolithic stone tools has made me think about the humans that inhabited northern Africa thousands of years ago. Looking at these tools, we can admire their cleverness for surviving in the ancient Green Saharan landscape that is a desert today as a result of climate change. When I hold the hand tool, it fits nicely in the hand. I can imagine that more than 10,000 years ago, it was used to scrape hides or the shafts for arrows. Amazing. There is so much to learn. 